Good evening from Nairobi, and thank you for joining us. I'm Cindy Salim, the program officer at Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, Rule of Law for Sub-Saharan Africa. We are honored to be joined by three panelists from the legal uh, profession who will be helping us to assess the current situation in sub saharan the current situation of the independence of the judiciary in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, with us, we have Mr. Diego Garcia Sayan, who's the special rapporteur on the independence of judges and lawyers. Diego Garcia Sayan was appointed special rapporteur on the independence of judges and lawyers in December 2016. He served as a judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights for two consecutive terms. He's, he also served as vice president of the court from 2008 to 2009 and the president of the court for two consecutive terms from 2009 to 2013. Some of the significant achievements of his four-year presidency include having increased the cost efficiency 32% of the rulings since the court's inception in 1979 occurred during this four-year period, boosting the organization's income by 50% in order to fund its budget and holding the first public hearing of the court in a CARICOM country, that is Barbados. During this period, the court issued several landmark rulings related to women's rights in context to violence, discrimination, and access to public information, among others. Mr. Garcia has broad experience working for multilateral organizations such as the United Nations, of, uh, the United Nations and the Organization of American States. He served as representative of the UN Secretary General for the Peace Agreements at El Salvador for the subsequent verification of the agreements reporting directly to the Security Council, member and chairperson of the UN Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances during several years, member of the Redesign Panel of the United Nations System of Administration of Justice, appointed by the UN Secretary General in 2006, head of the Electoral Mission of the Organization of American States, OAS, in Guatemala during the general elections in 2007. In Peru, Mr. Garcia served as Minister of Justice during the democratic transition in, in Peru and as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, proposing and promoting the Inter-American Democratic Charter adopted on 11 September 2001 by the General Assembly of the OAS, which he presided. He was also president of the high-level commission to design and implement the Museum of Memory, Tolerance, and Social Inclusion in Peru, inaugurated in December 2015. Mr. Garcia successfully performed public roles in critical situations, demonstrating his ability to identify strategic issues and lead change and democratic transition process in complex contexts such as internal conflicts and authoritarian regimes. Finally, he has experience in high level in high level diplomatic and policy negotiations on international peace security and inclusive development welcome mr garcia we are also joined by honorable justice hassan jallo the chief justice of the gambia he has served in different positions in the gambia he was the solicitor general from 1982 to 1984 proceeded to serve as the Attorney General and Minister of Justice from 1984 to 1994. In 2002, he became a Justice of the Supreme Court of Gambia till, 2000, uh, till 2002. He also served as a judge in the Appeal Chamber UN Special Court for Sierra Leone from 2000 to 2002. He was the Chief Prosecutor and UN Under Secretary General UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda from 2003 to 2015. He was the Chief Prosecutor and UN Undersecretary General, UN Residual Mechanism for International Criminal Tribunals from 2012 to 2016. He is currently the Chief Justice of the Gambia, a position he took up in 2017. His most recent assignments include being Chairman of the Africa Group for Justice and Accountability, member independent expert for review of the ICC 2020, member special panel of experts to review the report of the Ethics Committee on Allegations 
against the president of the African Development Bank 2020, member of the panel of the eminent Africans mandated by AU summit to prepare a short list of ranked qualified candidates for the senior leadership of the AU Commission 2020. He's an author of several books and articles. He's also married and a father to five children. Welcome, Justice Jallo. Thank we you, also, Cindy. Uh, we are also joined by Dr. Justice Mavet Zenge. Uh, he decided to be humble in his bio, but I'm sure most of you know him. So Dr. Mavet Zenge is a constitutional lawyer and a scholar who works as a legal advisor to the Commission of Juries, ICJ, the Africa program. So welcome very much, uh, Dr. Mavet Zenge. We are also joined by our program director, Dr. Stephanie Rotenberger, who will give us a few op uh, brief opening remarks and then proceed to invite sp our special rapporteur, who will also share brief remarks before we delve into our topic. Welcome, Dr. Stephanie. Thank you very much, Cindy. I would like to warmly welcome our participants of today's CAS Rule of Law seminar on the current situation of the independence of the judiciary in Sub-Saharan Africa. And also allow me to extend a particular welcome to our three distinguished panelists, UN Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers, Mr. Diego Garcia Sayan, Honorable Justice Jallo, Chief Justice of the Republic of the Gambia, as well as Dr. Mavit Zenge, of the International Commission of Jurists. My name is Dr. Stefanie Rotenberger, and I'm the new director of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation's Rule of Law Program for Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm particularly happy to be with you today, as for a long time, it wasn't clear when I would finally arrive in Africa, as I was held back by the Corona crisis for altogether seven months in Germany. And I was very eager to come here and take up my new post with Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And uh, I'm glad I finally arrived. And I can tell you that it feels very good to be finally here in Africa. As you might be well aware, um, our rule of law program of Konrad Adenauer Foundation puts its major focus on the promotion of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. We are active with our rule of law program on five continents. Here in Sub-Saharan Africa, we are divided into sections between Francophone Sub-Saharan Africa based in Senegal and Anglophone Sub-Saharan Africa based here in Nairobi. Today's seminar is part of a series of seminars that deal with the negative effects the Corona crisis has on the protection of human rights and the promotion of the rule of law. And what could be more essential to the rule of law than an independent judiciary, a functioning and strong judiciary, which brings me to the topic of today's seminar. Without a strong independent, without strong independent and impartial judges and lawyers, how should there be an effective enforcement of citizens' rights and liberties? And how should there be an effective separation of powers? Again, one of the main conditions of the rule of law. All these are issues of great concern to our rule of law program. How dangerous it can be when there are no impartial and independent judges left in a system can be easily seen when we go back in the history of my country, Germany, that was ruled in the mid of last century from 1933 to 1945 by a dictatorship. And one of the first actions this regime undertook after having taken over power was to eliminate the independence of the judiciary, which left Germany with, a, with an uncontrolled authoritarian regime that plunged Europe and the world into war. However, we do not have to go back that far in history. We can stay in the present as the independence of the judiciary is at stake every day in many countries of the world, be it more or less intensely, not only in Africa. 
be it through corruption, threats and intimidations against judges, intransparent or unjust systems of appointment or promotion of judges, corruption or simply underfunding of the judiciary. All these are factors that can paralyze the system. And when on top of this, a pandemic like Corona comes into play, that of course does not improve the situation. As citizens, Democrats, tourists, politicians, we should be aware that the functioning and the strength of the judiciary is under threat these days. And we should also be aware of the dangers that lie in this, like for example, an increasing deficit in trust and confidence of the citizens in the judiciary as the backbone of a functional constitutional state under the rule of law. Having said that, I'm really glad we've come together today here in this seminar to discuss the current situation of the judiciary in sub-Saharan Africa, especially against the backdrop of the current corona pandemic that has tangibly affected the delivery of justice in many places and in many cases. I'm sure we will, there will be a lot of questions to our panelists and we should all look forward to a lively discussion, an exchange of views on what the current situation is and how it can be improved, what actions governments could take in order to defend the independence of the judiciary, especially to the backdrop of the current crisis. I would now like to hand over to uh, Mr. Garcia, whom I would kindly ask to give us a brief overview on the stance and policy of uh, the United Nations with regard to the independence of uh, judges and lawyers. And after that, I would invite our two distinguished panelists from Africa to give us an overview and their assessment on uh, the current situation in Sub-Saharan Africa. Before then, Mr. Garcia will come back to us and, uh, and give us uh, his assessment on this very situation. So I thank you for, for your attention. I wish you a fruitful discussion. And I hope that with this seminar, we all can contribute to a very important and necessary debate. Thank you very much and all the best. Well, good afternoon, uh, good morning, whatever are you. Uh, really, I am uh, honored uh, to have the possibility to be today with you in this activity of the rule of law program, uh, especially in a panel uh, that has just begun, headed by uh, Dr. Rottenberger. And of course, uh, really honored to share this panel with uh, Chief Justice uh, Jallo, uh, Chief Justice of the Gambia and with uh, Justice Mavet Xene, because really uh, this is a fantastic opportunity to share some experiences, some view about this combination of the way in which independence of the judiciary should and could be uh, more effectively protected in this critical situation the world is, is living. Because as you all know, the independence of the judiciary in the legal profession are fundamental pillars of a democratic society, as Dr. Rothenberger has just uh, said in the introduction. Such independence is not provided for the benefit or protection of judges or lawyers as such, nor is it intended to shield them from being held accountable in the performance of their professional duties into the general law. Instead, its purpose is the protection of the people, affording them an independent legal profession an independent judicial system as the bulwark of a free and democratic society. Judges and lawyers, as we all know, play a vital role in the protection of rule of law and human rights. It is their role precisely to protect and establish the rights of citizens from whatever quarter they may be threatened. Their work, as we all know as well, is indispensable, indispensable for ensuring effective access to justice for all. But so do the opponents of the rule of law, the promoters of authoritarianism and of justice at the service of particular interests of impunity, 
corruption, and human rights violations. How does the United Nations is connected to this very important uh, matter for humankind? In 1994, the United Nations, through the then Human Rights Commission, noting both the increasing frequency of attacks on the independence of judges, lawyers, and court officials, and the link between the weakening of safeguards of the, for the judiciary and lawyers and the gravity and frequency of violations of human rights, decided to appoint a special rapporteur on independence of judges and lawyers. There have been several uh, rapporteurs since 1994, and it has, and, and has been recalled by Cindy, by the decision of the council, this responsibility has been assigned to me since December 2016. What is the legal and juridical framework for this activity of the uh, uh, special rapporteur besides the UN Charter, besides the, uh, the Protocol on Civil and Political Rights? There are two key instruments, which are first, the basic principles on independence of judges and of the judiciary adopted in, at the UN in 1985, 35 years ago. As we commemorate this year the 35th anniversary of the basic principles, we commemorate as well the 30th anniversary of the international standard that protects the legal profession, which is under threat in many parts of the world, the basic principles on the, on the role of lawyers adopted in 1990. At this stage, uh, both uh, instruments are essential parts of customary law, establishing main standards that should be implemented in all state parties of the United Nations, so to guarantee independence of justice and the functioning of the legal profession. Besides the extended and deep threats and challenges being placed to independent judges and lawyers around the world, the pandemic is placing additional threats and risk to public health and to justice and rule of law. We will have the opportunity to discuss more about that and how new challenges appear to the world in several countries with a reduction of budgets, with disputes around housing and land, uh, disputes that have to do with violence against women, uh, new situations of corruption, and so on, in a context in which it is very difficult to envisage uh, stronger judiciaries with stronger budgets, with less problems to solve. So with this introduction uh, that uh, as, as uh, following your, your, your petition, Dr. Rothenberger, I place this kind of matters and how uh, we can uh, respond to the permanent challenges, but especially to the new challenges that derive from the pandemic that is attacking uh, humankind all around the world. Uh, thank you very much. It will be a pleasure uh, to hear very attentively what uh, my colleagues in the panel will, will have to comment uh, and share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Garcia, for that, for the brief remarks and for the overview of what your office does. So right now we'll go to Chief Justice Jallo so that he can tell us how has the COVID pandemic, how it has affected the delivery of justice in Sub-Saharan Africa. Over to you, Justice Jallo. Thank you very much, Cindy. I'm delighted to have been invited and honored to, to meet some of my colleagues uh, on this panel. The independence of the judiciary, of course, at the best of times, is, is quite a challenge to maintain. Uh, and the, the challenges have become much more aggravated with this uh, pandemic. And the pandemic directly relates to the fundamental rights of access to justice particularly, and also the right of uh, litigants to have their matters determined within a reasonable time. So those two, two basic rights are very severely uh, undermined uh, by the pandemic. Um, we, we have, in the Gambia, we have not been spared, like any all other countries, uh, the pandemic, we've suffered from it, we continue to suffer from it. And uh, we had to take a number of measures in response uh, because with the pandemic on, the courts, people were reluctant to come to court to begin with, especially potential witnesses and parties and lawyers. And of course, court staff too were reluctant because of fears of infection. Uh, and so uh, the participants uh, were, were reluctant to come. So we had to take measures. The most drastic measure was uh, 
shutting down for a while operations. But we recognize, of course, you cannot suspend uh, the administration of justice. You cannot suspend law enforcement. You have to reopen and continue to work, to the work, take the necessary measures in order to ensure the safety and, and security of the of all the participants in, in the process. So it, it the, convi the 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 COVID pandemic has impacted on the judiciary here, uh, but we've also taken measures, and I think along the same lines in many sub-Saharan sub African countries, uh, measures including, for instance, limiting the, the numbers of cases that a court would take on a daily basis, uh, limiting the, the number of persons who would, who would be uh, would be within the courtroom in order to be able to maintain distancing, um, bringing in other measures of sanitation, uh, washing of hands, checking of temperatures, etc., and so on and so forth. Um, but I think more importantly also, we, we really had to review other working methods. We had to introduce with the help of the United Nations system, uh, this remote hearing of cases which could be dealt with in that manner. Particularly, for instance, cases relating to applications for bail, applications for release by persons who are in custody. We, we, we had to take steps and we, we were able to put in place a limited remote hearing system. Uh, which enabled us to deal with quite a number of uh, so, so, so cases. Um, we, the, the pandemic has actually exposed some of the major weaknesses in, in our system and, uh, and led us to the conclusion that some of the measures we've taken should not really just be COVID related, but they have to be permanent, long-term permanent measures. Uh, that they are necessary uh, in order to ensure that the court system can, can operate more efficiently. For instance, the introduction of technology uh, in, the, in the court process uh, at all levels, at all, at all levels within the court process, to reduce the need for uh, physical presence, for instance, uh, of parties in court, to reduce the need for litigants having to come to court or lawyers having to come to court for from administrative matters to, to judicial litiga litigation matters, et cetera. So one of the steps we've taken is actually to commission a, a, a committee to review our rules of rules of practice and procedure and also our substantive law in order to, to adjust them to make provision for the remote hearing of cases and also for remote filing of cases and service of, of documents as well. So that, that's, that's one, one thing we're we are looking at. Uh, we also have commissioned a study by an IT expert to see how we can better harness technology within the court system to enable us dispense with uh, physical presence of persons unless it's absolutely necessary. So those two measures we've taken uh, in order to deal with the, in, in the problem uh, uh, on a permanent basis. I must say though that all the steps that have been taken by the judiciary, taken by the judiciary in relation to dealing with the COVID pandemic have been dealt with in the context of the independence of the courts. These are not measures which have been imposed by the executive or the judiciary. The chief justice has exercised his authority under the constitution to give the necessary instructions, necessary directives for the better management of the courts. And so all the measures which we, which we have taken were issued uh, in that context. But uh, as I said, the, the pandemic has challenged very much uh, the efficiency, not so much the independence, but the efficiency of the judicial process particularly with regard to those two rights of access and of fair and expeditious hearing of matters. And we need to take measures uh, in terms of reforming our rules of practice and procedure, reviewing and improving on our work, working methods uh, in order to, to deal with this, with this problem on a more long-term basis. Thank you, Justice Jalo. Uh, most of us can identify with the challenges that you put across. So, um, Right now, let me move over to Dr. Mavet Zenge, who will give us the current situation of the independence of the judiciary in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Justice? Let me begin by saying, uh, saying thank you to the CAS Rule of Law team, uh, program team, for uh, inviting me to be part of this conversation. Uh, but more importantly, thank you for uh, creating this platform 
for a discussion on this on this particular topic. Uh, I would like to also uh, say thank you very much to the United Nations Special Rapporteur Diego Sayan and Chief Justice Jalo for uh, the compliments. Um, I think this is an important conversation to have, especially at this juncture when uh, we in this region are observing an increase in the number of cases involving interference with the independence of judges. Uh, um, judicial independence is uh, essentially the principle that judges must be left to perform their functions without interference from anyone. I, 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 I just want to underscore that uh, principle so that it becomes the point of departure for everything that I will uh, share with you this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are uh, tuning in from. Uh, so basically, judicial independence, I think the best way to understand it is to understand it as a principle. It's a principle. I, I don't want to refer to it as an idea, because when we say it's an idea, sometimes it, it, it um, gives the impression that uh, we are being idealistic. Yet this is actually a very practical uh, principle of law and governance. So it is a principle that judges must be left to perform their functions without interference from anyone, whether from government or from outside of government. Uh, respecting judicial independence is critical for purposes of ensuring that courts uh, are able to dispense justice without fear or fear. Uh, countries in East and Southern Africa, which really is the focus of the conversation today, have an obligation to guarantee respect and protect the independence of justice. And uh, Diego has done uh, good work in, in, in um, highlighting some, some of the sources of that obligation uh, in terms of uh, the United Nations uh, legal framework. And all these countries that we are talking about this evening or this afternoon are, are states parties to uh, the United Nations instruments, which oblige governments to guarantee respect and protect the independence of justice. And of course, on the African continent, we have the African Charter and, and other uh, uh, instruments which uh, really uh, require our governments to guarantee in the legal system, respect in their day-to-day -day activities, and protect the independence of, of, of judicial officers. Despite all of this, and of course, these obligations are also recognized in domestic constitutions. And, and uh, because we don't have time today, I'm, I'm not going to, 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 to uh, make any detailed references to constitutional provisions in countries within uh, East and uh, Southern Africa, which protect independence. But I think it is important to uh, note that a lot of uh, these constitutions actually lay out judicial independence as a principle of um, of, of governance, which is to be respected. Yet we are witnessing an increase in threats uh, against judicial independence. And in my presentation today, I will attempt to identify the nature of these threats. Um, so quickly, and I will illustrate with examples from, from some of the countries uh, in, in, in this region so that it can become clearer what I am talking about. So first is we are witnessing uh, threats against judicial independence that are coming in the form of constitutional and legislative amendments that are initiated by the executive branches of government. Chief Justice Jalo and the, uh, Mr. Diego Sayan, you would uh, recall that I think in the past 10 years in East and South Africa, we have, we have seen some tremendous improvements in terms of uh, uh, constitutional reforms that protect judicial independence. And uh, uh, that progress has been a source of pride for, for, for some of us. But what we have been witnessing in the past uh, three years and more recently in 2020 is that a lot of countries 
uh, are coming up with uh, constitutional amendments that are meant to reverse that progress which we have seen uh, in the past 10 years. So for instance, in Zambia, a, a bill was uh, tabled before parliament, which sought to tinker with the security of tenure for judges. And uh, thankfully, the uh, Zambian parliament uh, voted against that bill. So one hopes that uh, the bill will not be packaged in another format. And one hopes that we won't see it uh, again being brought back to parliament. In Zimbabwe, uh, as an example, there is another bill called Amendment Bill Number no. 2, which is before parliament as we speak. And it seeks basically to give the executive greater control over judicial appointments. Um, it, it seeks to allow the president as the head of state to end pick uh, judges from the high court, uh, who then can be appointed into uh, the higher courts, that is the Supreme Court and the Constitutional Court, without subjecting those judges to uh, a process of uh, interviews. Uh, the amendments, amongst many other things, undermine security of tenure by empowering the president as the head of the executive to renew contracts for acting judges of the constitutional court on an annual basis. And I think that is, that is how, I, I wonder how low things can get. I mean, to get judges, you know, uh, having their, I mean, working on the basis of contracts and these contracts being renewed by the head of the executive on an annual basis. So these are some of the constitutional changes or legislative amendments which are, are being processed in the region, which um, undermine um, certain core elements of judicial independence. The second uh, manifestation or type of threat against judicial independence is, is presented in the form of administrative reforms which allow judicial leaders to interfere with the decisional independence of judges. Uh, I think uh, the colleagues on the panel uh, know uh, that one of the elements of judicial independence is that uh, the judge himself or herself must be independent from other judges. So in other words, the judge must make uh, their ruling on the basis of the law without interference from other judges. They may consult other judges to hear their views, but the decision must remain theirs. Uh, but during the course of 2020 uh, in Zimbabwe, we saw um, the Chief Justice uh, issuing a directive, directing judges to submit their judgments for review before those judge judgments are handed down. And, and uh, thankfully, uh, that a directive was reconsidered and it was scrapped. Uh, and one hopes that uh, we, 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 we won't see that directive again. But worrisome, what is worrisome at the same time is that there is an, an anonymous letter purportedly written by judges in Zimbabwe and addressed to the president of the country in which the judges allege that the leadership of the judiciary is interfering with their decisions as judges. Uh, this, this letter, I think, raises issues of concern, I think, which require to be investigated. What is worrying, of course, is the response that uh, has been made by the executive branch of government, particularly the Minister of Justice, which has basically dismissed this letter as uh, fake and so forth. But um, one would have hoped that uh, there would be an investigation into the uh, authenticity of this letter. And if it is authentic, one would uh, want to, one would have hoped that there would be an investigation into the issues that are being raised, because those issues are serious. The third um, form of threat against judicial independence comes in the, in, in the form of uh, direct threats against the tenure and sometimes against the person of judges. Uh, we have seen this, for instance, in Malawi. In early 2020, this year, there were attempts to prematurely end the tenure of the Chief Justice on the grounds that he had accumulated more leave days than the remaining number of days for his tenure. The decision to terminate the Chief Justice tenure 
was made by the executive branch of government soon after the Supreme Court had confirmed the nullification of the presidential election results. So the so first and foremost, the executive branch of government were, could not, legally speaking, have made that decision because it is outside of their legal mandate. Uh, yeah. But secondly, that kind of decision came after, soon after the court had made a profound uh, ruling in, any, in a very politically sensitive matter. Uh, and and it, 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 um, it, it, it indeed presented itself as an, as an interference with the independence of, of the judiciary. Thankfully, that decision was nullified by the courts themselves following a court application by the Malawi Law Society. In Malawi, again, uh, in terms of, um, uh, I think this is in terms of a policy, there is a policy that has been practiced by uh, successive governments uh, until this recent government which came to power this year. There is a policy where judges, serving judges, are seconded to the executive to, to, sec, to executive positions where they would work in the executive arm of government uh, and uh, on a temporary basis and then they, they then come back to the judiciary uh, to occupy and or continue with their tenure as uh, judicial officers i'm aware of so for instance uh, the chief secretary to cabinet, which is the chief secretary of the executive branch of government uh, of the previous government, uh, was a serving judge who had been uh, uh, seconded into that position by the then president of Malawi. Uh, I'm aware of, of policy practices where judges are seconded to independent commissions, such as uh, human rights commissions, such as electoral commissions or electoral management bodies. But uh, I, I have not heard of, uh, I don't think it's a common practice to uh, second judges to executive positions. I think that is in violation of the principle of separation of powers and so forth and so forth. Um, in Kenya, uh, the president has refused to sway in about 41 candidates who have been nominated for appointment as judges. Uh, this is despite the fact that courts have directed the president to swear in those candidates as per the law. Instead, the president has chosen to, to, to issue veiled and sometimes open verbal threats against the, the judiciary, against the chief justice. And this comes against the background that in 2017, uh, the president, the current president of Kenya, labeled the judges of the Court of Appeal as crooks uh, who needed to be dealt with. Uh, and this is after they had nullified the results of the presidential election. Uh, another example is Lesotho, where the chief justice was suspended in 2018 in violation of an existing interdict, which directed that the chief justice could not be suspended until the finalization of a constitutional application in which she had challenged the decision to initiate a suspension. So, in summary, this chief justice was suspended uh, and later on removed from a position uh, in violation of a court interdict. Um, this chief justice was replaced by an acting chief justice. And now, as we speak, there are attempts to remove the current acting chief justice. And I think what has been happening in Lesotho is quite worrisome because it appears that the instability that is in the executive branch of government they, is sort of who also resulted in judicial instability in the sense that every time there has been a change of leadership in the executive, uh, there is also a change of leadership in the, um, in the judicial, usually inspired or initiated by the executive. And lastly, the threats against judicial independence also manifest in the form of underfunding. I think Chief Justice Jallo uh, talked about how COVID-19 has uh, created additional costs for the courts in his jurisdiction. It is true also when one looks at Southern and East Africa that uh, as many courts, as courts are trying to put in place measures to protect 
court users against the spread of COVID-19. They have had to fork out a lot of resources from their already uh, little budgets. So before COVID-19, we already had this problem of uh, judicial underfunding, uh, which in my view does not necessarily emanate from uh, resource constraints. Because, I mean, if you look at the levels of corruption in East and Southern Africa, you will see that the problem that our societies have is not necessarily that we have few resources. No, but it is the management of resources. A lot of resources are lost through corruption and mismanagement. But for me, the problem also is that the legal framework, when it comes to budgetary allocation, it relegates the judiciary to, to a ceremonial role in the sense that judiciaries in most of the countries in East and Southern Africa have very little say in the process of determining uh, budgetary allocations. They are sort of spectators. They wait to be allocated funds. And the executive, in my research, and, um, in my research, I have found that they, I have, I've come across complaints by the judiciaries, where judiciaries uh, claim that the executive uses their budgetary allocation powers as a weapon to cow judiciaries to toll certain, 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 uh, certain positions in their decision making or in their exercise of judicial authority. Uh, and, and I think uh, that, 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 is, that is what is up. You can see that in the, you know, when, when, when COVID-19 pandemic hit the region, you can see that uh, a number of countries have adjusted their budgets to increase uh, allocations towards the security service sector, to increase allocations to the health services sector, uh, but very little have been done to increase allocations to the judiciary. Um, and and, 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 and that, that, I think, is, is, is quite worrisome. In conclusion, the threats against judicial independence in East and Southern Africa appear to emanate from the executive branch of government. I'm saying appear because uh, it is possible that certain people or certain groups uh, that are powerful are also operating behind the executive branch of government. Uh, in this region, uh, we talk of state capture, where the state is captured by powerful economic groups who then use the, their control or their influence over the executive to control the other arms of government. Uh, so in this matrix, it is possible that the executive is 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 acting on behalf of of other interests, but the reality is that uh, what we see on the surface is that these threats against judicial independence are emanated are emanating from the executive branch of government, and they are in the form of constitutional amendments aimed at reversing constitutional safeguards on judicial independence. They are in the form of direct uh, threats against the tenure and person of judges, as well as judicial leaders. They are also in the form of administrative reforms and policies, as well as uh, underfunding. On that note, I will end, uh, Cindy and uh, Stefan, and I will uh, be happy to respond to any questions that uh, may have been triggered by my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mavet Zenge, for that comprehensive overview of the current situation of the independence of the judiciary in sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, from the two presentations by Chief Justice Jallo and Dr. Mavet Zenge, we've been able to hear the effects of the pandemic on delivery of justice, as well as the current situation of the independence of the judiciary. So uh, over to Mr. Garcia, what are the actions that can be taken by the government to prevent blockages of the justice systems to guarantee a functioning and independent judiciary amid the current situation. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you for uh, both uh, presentations. We give we have a very precise idea of the institutional climate that prevails uh, right now, which is practically not uh, substantially different 
than what is happening in several other parts of the world. Uh, there was a brilliant uh, presentation yesterday uh, at the annual congress of the International Bar Association uh, made by Ban Ki-moon, the former UN Secretary General, in which uh, he raised several matters that had to do with the effect, effect of the pandemic in the justice system in the world, in which he said very clearly that that pandemic is widening the justice gap, I, I quote, with a sharp increase in the problems that many people face just as the ability of justice actors to respond is declining. That will be one of the first problems, that the justice gap in which not only previous problems that we have in countries like the your countries or our my or my area in Latin America, in which there are several conflicts that are not being uh, treated properly by the justice system and uh, the, the rate of uh, social insecurity, public insecurity and so on, which is of course uh, a widening uh, matter that has to do of course with uh, consequences of the, directly of the pandemic of um, Justice Jallo has recalled in which uh, justice system have to limit the number of cases because there have uh, scarce possibilities to react with the appropriate resources in the new conditions that does uh, health uh, challenges demand. So that's one of the first problems, the widening of the justice gap. The second one, I would say I would, I would follow many of the matters that have been uh, raised by Justice Mavet Singh, the concentration of power, the weakening of checks and balances, which is one of the key aspects of the independence of justice to have checks and balances, to have an independent judicial system that can be trustable uh, by the society, not as an enemy of the political power, but just only as the word says, as a checks and balances. That is a process uh, that has always had in uh, Eastern, Western Africa and in Latin America, big challenges, but that uh, in many cases, there are new threats in which because of the health um, challenges, um, several states of emergency are prevailing, concentration of power in the executives, uh, legally based, based in many cases, is in several situations undermining the, 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 the role and the space of the judiciary. So these states of emergency and concentration of power that has some legitimacy, so to strengthen the capacities of the states to react against the pandemic is being used in many, in many places, like uh, not to swear certain judges, to dismiss uh, others. So a, a context that, that should be very closely uh, monitor and very closely uh, follow. A third challenge, I would say, uh, has to do with technology. No? Uh, uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Jalush has very properly mentioned the need to increase the capacities of our judiciaries to have modern technology, IT technology, so to uh, reduce the requirement of physical presence in, in, in judicial processes. That's, of course, it's a major challenge for judiciaries that have first scarce financial resources, second context of countries in which the uh, physical uh, internet connections are very weak or even non-existent in several parts of, of our countries. And third, a major challenge with this, which is uh, due process. So how to guarantee, for instance, in which this uh, processing in which you, you don't have, there, there's no requirement of physical presence to guarantee private communication between the lawyer and the person being investigated, for instance. I have been knowing very closely the case that the, uh, the, a Google problem that they installed in the judiciary in Peru, in which there was no way during these uh, hearings in which there, there could be a private communication between the lawyer and the person being uh, prosecuted. So the, a, a, a quite key element of due process was lacking because of a deficient uh, technology that was being chosen. So that has to do with technology, has to do with resources, and of course, be careful 
with due process as, as, as well, which is a new, a new challenge for, for IT uh, technology in the world. Fourth, uh, uh, corruption. Corruption, uh, which is a major matter in several countries of the world, but in context of a weakening of checks and balances, of additional and extraordinary resources to prevent or to fight against the pandemic is raised as an additional challenge that, of course, corruption existed before, but corruption has, in a way, strengthened its, uh, its hunger no? in, in raising what many people, I have heard this from a person in Zimbabwe, uh, the COVID billionaires no? that are being uh, built around these extraordinary resources or special attention to corruption and among the kind of cases that won't, shouldn't be left aside for after the pandemic is corruption as a major, as a major, as a major threat. And fifth, last but not least, uh, the question of financing, in which uh, Justin Mavet Sengen has mentioned very properly that this has to do with two aspects. First, the amount of resources, but of course, the way in which these resources are managed. Hmm? Because again, the figure of corruption that appears and the figure of eventually inabilities to have a proper management. So it's not a question to raise this aspect at the same time. But let's be clear and frank. No? Of course, management is a, a very important, a crucial problem. But the amount of resources, of course, is a crucial and permanent one in all of our country that has worsened after the pandemic began. In this uh, presentation, this is a speech that uh, Ban Ki-moon gave yesterday at the a IBA. It says, he says, I quote, funding for access to justice has declined by 40%, 4 in the last four years. And the economic downturn puts even greater pressure on financing. So there's a question of lack of resources. No? So our countries, Western and Eastern African uh, countries, uh, have the budgetary capacity to fulfill this extraordinary need? Uh, perhaps not. Perhaps there is no possibility to, to, to solve that big gap in need in, at this stage in the short run. So as after World War II, uh, there was a, a big Marshall Plan to uh, help uh, Europeans to uh, react against the disaster generated by the world war. Uh, this is other, other sort of war that is um, affecting mainly uh, poor countries in which uh, I would say extraordinary financing is needed. Extraordinary country, uh, finance to countries that uh, have uh, demonstrated the capacity, the will to uh, manage the resources without corruption, with efficiency. But of course, none of our countries will have the internal uh, budgetary capacities to react to these uh, huge gaps that exist. So, uh, to find uh, to finalize this 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 comment uh, in the pandemic, and that was a challenge before the pandemic, but has increased during and after the pandemic. Access to proper justice as a world priority uh, that uh, with uh, with components as the one that have, I have very briefly summarize following the fantastic presentations uh, by uh, Chief Justice Jalo and Justice Mavet Senge appear as a question which at this stage seems to be as important as medical doctors, as important as, as the vaccine that eventually will, will, will appear next year, uh, how to fulfill the needs of the world uh, to checks and balances to an efficient justice with needs imagination, which needs uh, proper technology, which needs uh, financial resources, but especially and above all, a clear uh, clarity that all of this works if we have an independent judicial system and that uh, states of exception, states of emergency are used only properly to fight the pandemic and not to concentrate power or to liquidate checks and balances. That would be my first uh, uh, comment uh, following all the important uh, views that uh, we have heard from uh, Chief Justice Jallo and from Justice Mavet Thank you very much, Cindy.
Thank you, Mr. Garcia, uh, for that. Uh, I'm seeing questions on our q and I'd also ask you to uh, ask more questions and we're going to go through them. So uh, Linus Mwauzi is asking, is it right for the government authorities to abuse human rights of citizens on what they want to when they want to enforce COVID-19 rules or protect citizens from being attacked by coronavirus? Also, was there any justification for the use of executive orders by the government during this pandemic, during this pandemic period? So we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, states issued emergency laws without consulting the judiciary, which is the custodian of the rule of law. Some of these laws infringed on human rights and did not conform to the principles of democracy. In some countries like Malawi and Kenya, the government was taken, was taken to court because of the unconstitutional nature of some of these laws. The judiciary in most countries was not able to protect the citizens against these infringements. So my question to Justice Jalo, what will the judiciary have done to ensure that their role was not overlooked and they were involved to guide states before the implementation of certain emergency laws, given the extraordinary circumstances of the pandemic and future circumstances that may find institutions unprepared. Justice Jallo. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, before I go to that question, I just want to go back on the resource issue raised by my two colleagues, Justice from Zimbabwe and the special rapporteur Garcia. Um, I think independence requires also efficiency, and efficiency requires proper investment of resources in the judiciary to ensure that it functions effectively. Perhaps some of it failure to invest may perhaps in some exceptional case to be deliberate. But I, I think also a major factor is the failure by states, by governments to recognize that investing in the judiciary, which means investing in the rule of law, as economic and social dividends for every community. If you invest in the rule of law, you're investing in stability, you're investing in economic growth, you're investing in peace. So it's not just for justice, it's for, for the whole good, good of the whole community you know, that, that you're investing. I think we need to, to impress this message very much on, on policymakers, on people in government, that when you invest in the judiciary, invest in the rule of law, for the ultimate good of the country, both social and economic, and, and we have to struggle with, to get that message uh, recognized. Uh, the COVID pandemic requires the taking of extraordinary measures in order to, to, to deal with it. But those extraordinary measures do not mean that you have to violate the law. I think the law uh, makes allowance and procedures for dealing uh, with, with, this, with this particular situation. In the Gambia, for instance, the, what the government did was to declare a state of public emergency under the constitution, which then authorized it to take certain measures uh, to curtail certain liberties, like uh, public gatherings, uh, movements, in terms of courtrooms, and so on and so forth. So it was done constitutionally, and uh, the matter was taken to the National Assembly. And as I mentioned, as far as the judiciary is concerned, the government itself did not take any steps concerning the operation of the judiciary. It was exclusively the chief justice who, who, set, who promulgated uh, regulation under the constitution uh, to, to determine what measures should be implemented in the judiciary to deal with the problem. It calls for those measures don't require stepping out of the realm of taken within the context of the law and the, and, and, uh, and, and the law is complied with, even if we're citizens' rights and liberties are abridged. That, that's permitted to some extent under a state of emergency, of assembly, etc., and, and provisions of the, of the public also being in such situations limit certain rights of, 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 of citizens. But the legal protocol to make sure that uh, in, in order to, in order to proceed with its limitation. The tools are there, legal there, the procedures are there. A state of emergency, as I said, empowers the state to take some of these uh, measures, and that's the way we went to, uh, to Gambia. Thank you, Justice Jalo. 
So uh, Mr. Garcia has spoke of the need to increase technology capacity in order to reduce physical contact. And we know many courts resorted to online processes when it became apparent that physical court could not take place. How best can the judiciary utilize technology to ensure that fast a smooth transition from the analog way of handling matters to ensuring tech savvy to allow and maintain public confidence in the digital system? And also is digitalization of court processes the future of court or the new normal? We also have a question from Jill Guy from Katiba Institute asking, does the shift to online hearing impact on the right to have one's matter decided by a court in public? And also, is this relevant to judicial independence? Because trials in, in public are not just a right of litigants stroke accused, but enable monitoring of the system. So I'll, I'll ask Dr. Mavet Zenge to respond to those questions. Thanks, uh, Cindy. Um, Good afternoon, uh, Abariako Prof. Jill. Uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult for me to answer a question uh, from Professor Jill because um, she, she, she is one of my respected luminaries in this, in this sector. And so I, I, I always feel inadequate when I'm, <laughs> when I'm in, a, in a conversation with her, but I will attempt. So I, I think. Um, the starting point really for me is 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 the the principles the basic principles uh, of access to justice one of which is that uh, and i think it's underscored in, under stg 16 as well it's 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 the requirement that uh, you know everyone must have access to justice so you know, the means of justice or the means of dispensing justice must be accessible to all, uh, regardless of who their socio-economic or political standing in society. Um, now, the reality in most of our countries or most of our societies is that uh, there are huge parts of our society who, or population which uh, do not have internet connectivity and therefore uh, become excluded from uh, accessing justice uh, through digital courts as we, we call them now. Uh, but I am reminded of uh, a report uh, written by uh, the UN United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression in 2011 where uh, the special rapporteur underscored the principle that uh, uh, access to internet is a human right. Uh, in other words, it is a right just as we treat um, other rights like education um, and so forth, uh, I mean, access to information and so forth. But I, I, I don't think that our governments in the region, I also don't think that the citizens themselves in this region have really appreciated uh, that internet access to internet is a right, it must be treated as a right, and therefore it must be made accessible to, to everyone. I say this because in, um, in, in most of our countries, including here in South Africa, where I am currently, uh, the costs for data are very high. Uh, the costs for data, when you look at Vodacom, you look at MTN, uh, and I'm sure these are the countries that are open, these are the companies that are also operating in, in, in the rest of, of, our other, of our other countries, of course, using other uh, trade names. The costs for, for data are very high. Uh, and also governments are doing very little in terms of promoting access to, to internet. And civil society's advocacy on the right to internet seems to be very uh, low. There is very little action that is being taken to sort of um, actualize this right of access to internet. Now, what COVID-19 has done is to expose that vulnerability, to expose that shortcoming. 
uh, in the sense that uh, we can't interact as humans in the way that we, we are used to. We can't access the courts in the way that we are used to. And the alternative now is to digitize. But these sort of solutions are being recommended at a time when we have not treated uh, access to internet as a right in practice. We have done so in theory, but we have not done so in practice. So my view is, if, and I don't think we have a choice, perhaps uh, digitizing the court, system, the court seems to be the, the way forward, seems to be the new, I don't know if I could call it a normal, because it is not for, for a huge part of our society. But digitizing the courts seems to be the, probably the only viable way forward. But for us to be able to do that, we need to ensure that everyone enjoys their right of access to the internet. So that's what we need to do. Um, and again, we go back to the issue of resources, which uh, 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 the panelists, I think, agree that although it takes resources to make some of these rights a reality, uh, but the problem that we have in the region does not seem to be that we don't have resources. It seems that we have the resources, but these resources are being mismanaged through corruption and, and, and other forms of abuse. So my point is we need to make access to internet a right in reality. And then after that, we will be able to, to, to uh, digitize the courts and, and, and many people will be accessible to them. But of course, we also need to, and I'm sure uh, Chief Justice Jalo would agree that uh, you, we also need to uh, look at our procedures, procedures for hearings, procedures for trial, and so forth. And I, I think the right to be tried in public, which Professor Jill talked about, should be respected because it's part of our constitutional rights. And therefore, I think we need to give that option to, uh, or rather to, to, pro to make that consideration on a case-by-case -case basis as to whether this particular case, it is appropriate that it must be a case that should be had in, in a physical court. And of course, there must be an objective criteria for making that assessment or for making that determination. Um, so I think the, the option must still be there to uh, conduct physical court hearings, but where possible, because we are in a pandemic where we, we cannot always meet in public, then uh, we, we should have the option to uh, conduct um, uh, um, uh, uh, digital hearings. So that, that would be my response. Thank you, Dr. Mavet Zenge. I'd like to know if uh, Justice Jalo would like to say something about that. I, I do agree with, with, uh, with Prof. that we do need to review our rules, practice our rules of procedure uh, in order to facilitate access to justice, in order to ensure that uh, trials can proceed reasonably well. Um, there is a challenge in using uh, remote hearings, of course, some kind of cases may not be suitable for that. We are looking into that here, uh, even as we experiment with, with remote trials. Some trials are not suitable, appropriate for that. Some are. We've used, for instance, the remote process up to now, largely for hearing of application for bail by persons who are in custody, mile two. There is no need for them to come over here. The hearing could be remotely when the, the lawyer is concerned and the judge is concerned, and the other party in the prison can, can also be linked, linked to, the, to the process. Um, but overall, we need to, to review our rules for structure and procedure to, to have greater efficiency. But again, you, you ask yourself, for instance, um, do, does everybody need to come into the courthouse premises in order to file their papers? No, if you can file your papers electronically, it saves a lot of time. 
and reduces the risk by by doing so. Do people have to do stuff? of the judiciary have to go out physically to serve papers if this can be sent electronically? Yes, they, they don't need to go. They can do that electronically if it can be done. It saves time, it reduces risks, et cetera. Certain kinds of cases can be had also remotely, as I said. Certain cases may not be appropriate. But we need to look at all that in the context. Thank you, Justice Jalo. I think there are dialogues to bring technology in courts. It's just that uh, COVID-19 has just fast-tracked uh, this uh, has fast tracked this. So moving on, uh, there, be, there are assertions from the general public and by extension the executive that the judiciary is not doing its best in ensuring that those who do not abide by the law are held accountable. This has also been expressed during this pandemic where funds meant to curb the spread of COVID-19 have been stolen and yet no one has been held accountable. While those in the legal profession know that this is not entirely the fault of the judiciary, because the judiciary depends on the evidence brought by it to brought before it by the prosecution and the police or investigation bodies before a conviction is arrived at, how can the judiciary ensure that they work well with other key actors to ensure that justice is done and seen to have been done? Over to you, Mr. Garcia. It's a very important uh, matter because obviously uh, not in all circumstances the judicial systems are reacting uh, properly regarding the, the, the dimension of the facts of uh, corruption, for instance, connected to the additional resources for the pandemic or for uh, general or common crime. No? Uh, that can be seen from different views. No? <clears throat> can be blamed uh, is, uh, for the, to the judiciary, but as he's been uh, included in your comment uh, in our question, uh, Cindy, of course, the criminal process uh, proceeds only after uh, something is being done by the prosecution. So uh, this again raises the matter which, in which the rapporteur has been insisting in the last years, but we should deal and promote an independent judiciary and as well an independent prosecutorial system, regardless of the way in which, in, according to the national constitution and legislation in each country, the way in which the prosecutors or the general prosecutors are appointed. In several countries, they, have, they follow a political appointment, like for instance, in the case in the United States or even in Spain in which a general prosecutor is appointed by the chief of the government. So that in some countries would, would raise a big uh, question mark if that prosecutorial service would be in a way independent. But regardless of that, in any case, there are certain standards, certain rules by which prosecutorial services should be independent vis-a-vis -vis political powers. So that's absolutely crucial so that the judicial system is able to investigate and to act uh, promptly and efficiently against corruption. And a second and important aspect that I am, have been raising since my first report in the General Assembly three years ago, which is the way in which certain kind of corruption, the transnational corruption, corruption in which the state, the governments are infiltrated by these big gangs no? is a way through which human rights are being attacked at the same time. If with this global corruption, one can imagine that four or 5% of the gross global product is being deprived from, some, from societies, deprived from possibilities of investment in schools, hospitals, or roads. Uh, it's a question of human rights to impede that kind of uh, appropriation of these resources by, by corruption. So at in what extent, uh, in this context, uh, prosecutors and judges will be able to be efficient in this, uh, against this global corruption without taking into consideration, for instance, the very important provisions of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, which establishes fantastic mechanisms of cooperation, of judicial international cooperation, not following uh, cumbersome diplomatic processes, 
but just establishing base in the, in the convention in which all African countries are part of it, uh, direct communication between prosecutorial services and judges. So I would strongly suggest that this uh, uh, convention is uh, discussed properly among uh, prosecutors, among judges, in which in many cases, many of them will eventually discover, okay, perhaps in this case, I can ask this uh, neighboring country, this uh, the other place to give me more information without following uh, complex diplomatic processes. So I would say that uh, in, let's uh, insist that not only judges, but prosecutors should be independent from uh, political power, should be neutral regarding political power, in which there are now uh, extraordinary universal principles of cooperation, the standards of investigation against corruption that we should review in each country until what extent the internal procedural uh, rules follow that uh, international standards or they should be eventually improved or adapted. I am sure that all of, in all of the countries, not only in Africa or Latin America, but uh, in Europe and, and in Asia, there should be some uh, consideration of that kind of improvement. So there are many things uh, to, 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 to improve in that area, Cindy. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. And from our Q&A section, I can see Lady Justice Aluoch asking uh, this specific question to Justice Jallo. And she's saying a uh, COVID-19 pandemic has shown that in some extreme situations, such as this period, the court systems may not be able to deal with pressures effectively in fair and effective way. Do you think that now is the time to actively promote alternative justice system, such as the traditional dispute resolution mechanisms? Yes, I, I agree. I think we, we need to promote alternative ways of settling disputes. Um, we, in the Gambia here, we have our traditional customary courts which have been functioning uh, since independence and, and we intend to, to retain them because they have uh, advantages of speed of familiarity and lack of uh, complex rules of procedure and evidence. At the same time, we are also promoting uh, ADR within the conventional court system. We find too many cases came, come into court without really any attempt at uh, settlement before risk of summons are issued. And so we want to insist that there must be a process of, uh, there must be at least some attempt at, at, at settlement before these cases go for trial or before even cases are instituted in, in, in our court. Uh, you're absolutely right. But that should be, be really a permanent feature of the, of the system rather than just COVID related. Thank you, Justice Jallo. And we have a question from Ruben Okari, who asks, how do we ensure that other arms of government respect and abide by the rule of law, especially where the executive and legislature claim that the judiciary are not elected by the people, hence do not have authority to dictate them? He gives a key example of the Chief Justice of Kenya's advice to the president to dissolve uh, the parliament. I'd ask Mr. Garcia to respond to this question. Well, I, I don't have all the elements to, to uh, share, give an opinion regarding the specific uh, situation that has been mentioned uh, on Kenya, no? but only a general uh, comment on this kind of uh, hunger for absolute power, I would say is as universal as human rights, no? because this tendency this hunger exists in several countries. We have seen how, for instance, in Poland, there has been this uh, temptation uh, that has succeeded in concentrating uh, power in the government as it has happened in Hungary as well, two democratic countries. No? So uh, in a way, uh, this uh, is, uh, can be seen as a major challenge for contemporary societies worldwide in which a strengthening institution, a strengthening civil society, a strengthening freedom of expression of one of the several rights that are crucial to counterbalance this temptation uh, for absolute power to eliminate checks and balance, that should be a path to be promoted and, 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 and sponsored. Uh, of course, uh, this idea in which 
a political power uh, pretends or tries to control the, the judiciary is a temptation that is not African or Latin American. It exists worldwide. The big question is uh, why that is not possible to be done in certain countries, in several democratic countries, because social and democratic awareness of the society, because there is counterbalance of strong institutions that will say the chief of state, no, you cannot do this. You cannot dismiss the chief justice because you don't like him or her. You need to respect his uh, position because that's what the constitution and the law says. So in that context, I think I think that uh, the, the national in, in, in institutional awareness and the role of civil society is the crucial thing. A weak institution like the uh, rapporteur on independence of justice and, and lawyers, I say weak because there is no uh, coercive uh, capacity um, uh, to, to counterbalance this, can only support these national or regional efforts uh, by lawyers, by judges, in which we are, one can see different aspects, the way in which increasingly uh, judges among them are, are establishing increasing uh, strong relations between themselves uh, at, the, at the regional level. Uh, the European Association of Judges, for instance, is playing a fantastic role to defend independence of justice in Poland. They have uh, organized rallies, uh, judges from different parts of Europe have gone to Poland to react against this. I think we should study uh, more closely in areas like Africa or Latin America, the way in which this interaction between judges, judges organization, judges have the right to organize themselves. And I have presented last year a report to the Human Rights Council until what extent judges have the right to freedom of expression, which is absolutely a crucial right that should be exercised and utilized for the good thing, which is defending independence of, uh, of justice. So I think that many things can be improved in that aspect, more dialogue, more interaction, more exchange of information uh, by which all the good things that are being done in certain countries can be uh, new, known and utilized in other countries and bad things that eventually occur can be matter of uh, a, a reaction, not only of the individuals specifically affected, but um, as a question of principles that should be taken into consideration. And of course, uh, I finalize with this um, organization of lawyers, because lawyers have been harassed and attacked in many parts uh, of the world. More than 50 lawyers have been uh, killed in, in, in the Philippines. No? And so um, bar associations as well, independent bar associations can play a very important role in this interaction for independence of justice. So I think that will be uh, important things in which I am not uh, promoting to invent the will because that, or that, that connections already exist, but perhaps that could be strengthened and, and improved. Thank you, Mr. Garcia, for that. Uh, Dr. Mavet Zenge, you spoke about the constitutional and legislative amendments as one of the great uh, ch uh, challenges that the judiciary is facing. And we have someone asking who is to guarantee the implementation of the constitution. If not done, who is to be held responsible? Also, we have uh, someone else who was stating that there is a proposal of the to have the judiciary ombudsman to be appointed by the president of the republic rather than the chief justice. Do you see a potential threat to the independence of the Kenyan judiciary in that? Um, difficult questions, but. Um... Let me add him. I think I think the implementation of constitutions is a collaborative effort between the citizens and their government. That's that's what I think. Um, citizens have got to organize uh, using civil society as an avenue, using the academia as an avenue. Uh, they need to organize and uh, ensure that they hold uh, their governments accountable uh, for purposes of enforcing and implementing the constitutions or constitutional commitments. There is no other 
other other way of doing it. And and this is why, and this is where judicial independence becomes very important because um, a common feature uh, in contemporary constitutions is a declaration which usually comes early in the constitutional uh, text, which says the constitution is the supreme law of the land. Um, now, it, that declaration uh, assumes that there is a body or an arm of the state that is responsible for ensuring that the constitution is in practice the supreme law of the land. And that arm of the state is the judiciary. But that, but enforcing the constitution can only happen if the judicial is independent. And that's why judicial independence is very important. And that's why citizens have got to keep watching um, and making sure that they deal with, they do their part to deal with the threats against judicial independence. Because in my view, judicial independence is the cornerstone of any constitutional democracy. It is the ingredient without which you can never have uh, constitutionalism. You can have a, a, a new constitution, but uh, without constitutionalism. Constitutionalism comes uh, only when uh, there are institutions uh, that are able to enforce the constitution. And one of those institutions is the judiciary. Uh, so the, the answer to that question is that it's a collaborative effort between uh, the citizens and their governments. But sometimes it's not collaborative, sometimes it's confrontational in the sense that the citizens have got to um, um, uh, challenge certain decisions, certain policies made by government, and they've got to do so in court uh, or using the judiciary as an instrument for enforcing the, the, the constitution. And that, that means, you need, so I've already talked about why judicial independence is important for purposes of implementing the constitution. But the other issue, which is very important, is civic space. You see, because these issues are interrelated. In order for citizens to be able to organize themselves and demand accountability from government, there must be space for the citizens to be able to do so. But without going much into detail, I think we are also seeing very worrisome, a worrisome trend in this region where governments are, uh, are coming up with the laws that are targeted at closing down the civic space. Uh, I think uh, this one will be interesting for, for you, uh, Chief Justice Gallo and Special Rapporteur Diego. There is a bill in, in Zimbabwe, as I speak, in Parliament. There is a, I mean, there is a bill that has been passed by cabinet, which will soon find its way to, to Parliament. The bill seeks to criminalize a communication of so-called falsehoods to foreign powers by Zimbabweans. So if you communicate a falsehood to a foreign entity, to a foreign power, you will be jailed. Huh? So even if, so if that bill comes into power, I mean, if that bill is enacted into, into law, uh, and what I say here on this platform, if it is deemed to be false, I could be jailed. So imagine the chilling effect that those kind of laws have on, on the right of citizens to express themselves and to organize. We have seen similar laws in Tanzania. So it's not just Zimbabwe only. We have also seen closure of civic space in Kenya uh, using COVID-19 as, as, as an excuse. So my point is, you need to look at these things holistically in order for you to then create a society that has the right mechanisms and functional mechanisms uh, which enable citizens to demand accountability from their political leaders. Uh, and only then, you then can have uh, 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 the constitutions being fully implemented, and then you can have constitutionalism. The last question was about um, the Ombuds person. Am I right, Cindy? Yes, Cindy? being appointed by the president instead of the chief justice. Yeah, I, I think that, that, I assume that relates to Kenya. Um, look, I think uh, we should not try to 
uh, reinvent the wheel every time we are doing these things. Um, I think there is already good practices or best practices, uh, you know, on the appointment of similar structures. The responsibility for the judicial ombudsperson or office of the ombudsperson will really be to um, uh, enforce accountability uh, and ensure that judges are accountable, judicial officers are accountable, judicial officers and their staff are accountable. We need to go back to the international and regional standards, which Diego uh, mentioned earlier on is our common ground for engagement, the rules of cooperation, the principles of cooperation. What do they say about judicial accountability? Mechanisms for judicial accountability should be strong enough to ensure that they are not used as avenues for interfering with the independence of the judiciary. So if you then establish a mechanism of judicial accountability, uh, if you established if you establish it in such a way that the executive arm of government uh, dictates who then should be part of that accountability mechanism, I think well, then, then I think it defeats the entire purpose. Uh, in other jurisdictions, the, these accountability mechanisms exist within the Judicial Service Commission. So if you look at the South Africans, you look at the Zimbabweans, you look at the Malawians, there is um, a, a, a committee within the Judicial Service Commission, which is called the Complaints uh, a Committee, the Disciplinary, the Complaints and Disciplinary Committee. Who appoints that committee? It is appointed by the Judicial Service Commission, which is deemed to be an independent institution. So I would, I would argue that in the case of Kenya, if, uh, if you desire to establish the Obad person for the judiciary, then that office must be appointed by an independent institution. And the independent institution in this case should be the, the Judicial Service Commission. And that, that would be my, my, my submission about that. Thank you, Dr. Mavet Zenge. So I'll, we are almost winding up. So I'll go to Mr. Garcia and ask him, is there a country specific example that you can use whereby the three arms of the government have put aside their differences and worked together to ensure swift action in addressing the pandemic while at the same time ensuring the rule of law has not been undermined? Well, it's a, a very difficult <clears throat> question and impossible to, to, to answer no? because I always avoid to make comparisons between countries. Each country deserves its own analysis. They have their own history. And of course, what is happening now uh, can be understood only following all that, uh, that history. But I would say that it's a, a major challenge in a context in which uh, justice and rule of law has been deteriorating in the last year uh, since the pandemic began. I think that's a, 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 a general thing that can be uh, draw as a conclusion, of course, with different levels of depth. No? But the, 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 the challenges is what I would say are very important and that we can obviously, we can imagine several situations in Africa, Latin America, Europe, in which countries are following the appropriate step to react uh, to, the, to the pandemic uh, to increase uh, uh, resources and to respect independence of the judiciary. Not in every country of the world, uh, just, just judges are being attacked, but it is being used as a pretext in several areas of the world. So what I would say, uh, and perhaps to finish, is, is recall again this important uh, message uh, given by Ban Ki-moon yesterday in the International Bar Association, that at this stage, access to justice, to independent justice, is one of the key priorities uh, worldwide. This uh, in, in a react against a process in which the justice gap is widening uh, because of the limited access to justice, 
because the, the, the new problems that arise because of the pandemic, and of course, uh, in last but not least, increase international cooperation between judges, between lawyers, between civil society to prevent these uh, additional restrictions on justice and to increase the capacity to protect independence. I see one of the questions, why do you say independence of lawyers? No, independence of judges and prosecutors. Lawyers, that what, what must be respected is the function of lawyers. Lawyers should be respected as such, regardless of the kind of person uh, they are uh, protecting and defending. So uh, thank you very much again for the opportunity to share these views and uh, to, to have this fantastic uh, possibility to be with uh, uh, Honorable Justice Jallo and with uh, Justice Mavid Senge. I, at this stage of the morning, afternoon, I feel already that we are friends and that we can see us, us again in, in other occasion. And thank you, uh, Cindy, for, for your presentation. And, and, and Dr. Stephanie, of course, thank you very much as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Gar Garcia. I'll now want to ask uh, Chief Justice Jallo if he has anything that he'd like to say before we conclude. Well, just to assure our colleague Garcia, we are indeed friends now. We are all combatants in a common cause, a common flight, right? And we look forward to working together. Just to reiterate that judicial independence is extremely important. And as Garcia said, it's not just for the judges. It's not just for those who come to court. It's for the benefit of the wider community. Secondly, also, I think as judges, it's important we also recognize that we also have duties, the duty of impartiality. It's not just independence for which we must struggle. We must also struggle within ourselves to ensure that we are impartial, we are free from all kinds of influences. It's not just an issue of independence. Efficiency also is necessary. It's not, I think it's good enough to be independent, but you need to go beyond that and make sure that your system is efficient, able to deliver justice fairly, I mean, reasonably well and reasonably timelessly. And that requires, of course, efforts by judiciary, but also investment by, by the state, serious investment by the state make sure that our working methods, our institutions, our, our infrastructure, our equipment, uh, and that it, it's all in the right state to, to, to enhance our efficiency. And that that kind of investment also goes beyond just acting the judiciary. It has its social and economic evidence. With, with, a, with, a, with an efficient judiciary, uh, you, you, you are investing in, in, as I said, in social justice, in stability and in economic progress, economic and social development. That all comes with respect for the rule of law. And the best of the world. I think our states need to, our statesmen need to get that message also very, very strong. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, Justice Jallo. So uh, we've come to the end of our session. I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time to join and engage with us during this session. On your screen, you shall see two evaluation questions. Kindly respond to them. The evaluation is anonymous and we shall appreciate your feedback. You can also engage us on Twitter at CAS underscore Law Africa and on Facebook on CAS Rule of Law Program for Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm going to give you a few more seconds to respond to the, the evaluation questions. You can see most of you are responding, thank you. Okay, so now I think we're going to close uh, the poll. So special thanks to our panelists, Mr. Garcia, Chief Justice Jallo, and Dr. Mavet Zenge, who have shared with us profound discussions. To the participants, thank you for your participation. We hope that this session has been worth your time. And last but not least, thank you to our hosts, the Lawyers Hub, uh, to Ken and your team, we appreciate your service. From us here in Nairobi, we wish you a good day, a good afternoon, and a good night, depending with where you joined us from. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, goodbye. Nice to meet you all. Thank, thank you, thank you, Gracia. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Cindy. Goodbye. <laughs>